Hi, friends. Welcome to Encouraged and Equipped. On this podcast, we introduce you to the women of Christ Chapel Bible Church. We love being encouraged to live out our faith in Jesus by hearing the stories of women in our church community. We are so glad that you're here. In some ways, Tammy O'Neill's story feels like a movie. Growing up on the mission field, knowing only how to dial a two-digit phone number, and riding a bus with her sister across the Philippines, helping to find her parents at the final stop. In other ways, her story is every Christian's calling to follow a faithful God wherever He leads. Through ups and downs across multiple countries, she has followed, now finding joy teaching a group of fourth grade boys on Sunday mornings. Here's Camille and Kami's conversation. Hi, and welcome to Encouraged and Equipped. I am so excited that I get to have my friend Tammy O'Neill with me here today, and we're going to hear Tammy's story. Um, Listener, I'm going to tell you something right now you need to know. Tammy has written a book, and it's going to be coming out sometime in the next year or so, Um, and she will never tell you that, and she's so humble, but I just want you to know so that you can get it and read it at some point when it comes out. Sorry to embarrass you, Tammy, but I'm so excited. Um, Tammy, what is something that has brought you joy? A small thing that's brought you joy. Well, thank you so much for having me first. Yay! I'm so glad you said yes. <laughs> You're so kind. Um, a small thing that's brought me joy. I would say lately, um, a cup of coffee, which sounds ridiculous because I am not a coffee snob by any means. <laughs> I will drink anything but Folgers, but I wake up quite early to run and it's dark and cold and miserable and that all I can think miserable. about is the cup of coffee I'm going to drink when I get home and sometimes ah. my husband's already <laughs> awake and he's brewing it and so I walk in and I'm like mm. ah. that's what I need. so lately that's what I look forward to nice yeah. how long of a run are we talking um like Maybe 10 miles or so. Maybe 10 so, miles. My it goodness sounds gracious, delicious after Tammy. That. <laughs> that does sound delicious after a very, very, very long run. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How fun. I love that. Well, Tammy, we all want to know about you. Um, listener, if you've seen Tammy, you might have seen her in the children's ministry wing, um, taking care of some kiddos and wrangling them and sharing the joy of Jesus with them. Or you might have seen her um, hanging out with middle school girls or at kids camp. Um no matter where you've seen her, we want to know her. And um, Tammy, I would love to know where are you from? How did you come to know the Lord? Well, I grew up in a really small island, on a really small island in the Philippines. So mm. I'm a missionary kid, which I'm proud to say. A lot of people maybe kind of hide the fact that they're MKs, but I love being an MK. And my mm. parents um, felt called in the 70s to move to the Philippines. So I was born in the Philippines and lived there until I was about 17. Oh, wow. Um, mm-hmm. So let's see. I was born in the city, but we would often move up to the island. Tiny island is actually near Taiwan. <gasps> and my memories of it are jungle. So mm. just imagine like tropical rainforest on a volcanic island. That is incredible. Well, yes, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you think of tropics, you think of white sandy beaches. These were like lava boulders. So there was no sand tanning on the beaches, but mm-hmm. I loved it. Um, yeah. And we we would live maybe two months at a time there and then um, kind of move back to the mainland where my parents would work on the translation. They were called to translate the Bible for this group of people. Mm-hmm. So I think when I look back on my childhood, it's all good memories and adventurous times uh, living on a tropical island. Mm. But I think my parents really taught me the importance of scripture. And mm-hmm. so scripture was always just held in such high regard in our family. And I think that's because they were translators. And so they mm-hmm. went through every verse of the Bible and just trying to determine what the Lord was saying, how to express it the best way to the people and the language of their heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so they could really understand God's message of love and hope and the good okay. news of, of Christ. Mm-hmm. So from a, a small child, I just loved reading the Word of God. And I'm an English major, and so I just love reading generally. But m- really, the Word of God just really touched my heart from a child. Mm. I remember reading with my parents um, multiple times through 
the scriptures in different languages, but verse by verse, even Leviticus, all the names. Wow. So <laughs> we never skipped over those. Wow. Um, that's which, incredible. Yeah. Led into so many conversations just about life. Um, but what always struck me about scripture was they were real people mm. and they walked the footsteps of Christ, you know, following him and they had tangible interactions with him. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of always envious of that, like, man, how come they got to see Jesus? But then I began to realize as I read scripture that I could know Jesus, I could see him and I could mm-hmm. feel his presence and talk to him and know him in a personal way. And so I don't actually remember a day or time or even an age yeah. where I came to know Christ. I just know that um, probably it was around seven or eight. Yeah ish in those that age group. Um, but about nine, I kept asking my parents to be baptized. Mm-hmm. And they kept saying, well, why do you want to be baptized? You know, it's just making sure I understood, yeah. you know, the significance of it, but that it was not salvific in itself. Um, and so I kept asking them, I want to do what I want to do it. And my my response to them was because I feel like my faith cannot be private anymore. It mm. has to be public. It's got to be something that if I'm to stand on the word of God and I'm to claim him, mm-hmm. then he should be able to claim me in public. Wow. And so I was baptized when I was 10. Um, so and it we, was, yeah. you Is that like part of your character? Like, would that be a very natural thing for you to do to say like, I want to publicly declare no. <laughs> in front of people. I just, I knew the answer, but I needed you to say it because. <laughs> yeah. I, if you see me at church and you know me, I, you probably don't think I'm super shy and introverted, but I, I actually am. Um, I'm surrounded by fourth grade boys a lot and that's, you, you know, there's just <laughs> chaos in my classroom, but I am naturally just super shy. Um, I don't like attention. I don't like to be put on the spotlight. So this whole process here is really out of my comfort zone. <laughs> so <laughs> to be, you know, baptized publicly, it was really just a step of faith saying, Lord, yeah. this is what you want me to do. And at 10 years old, it was just, you know, in a, in a sense, just like, oh, I got to do it, you know, so yeah. this is what I'm going to do. So mm, I love that. ironically, I was baptized on John the Baptist Day in the Philippines, which um, is a national holiday. They're a Catholic country. And so you could be sort of doused with a bucket of water at any point if you step outside. And, oh, my goodness. Um, as part of their holiday, people will go to, you know, lakes or rivers just to celebrate. So here we all show up, these white expats, you know, trying to – what they thought, I'm sure, was celebrate their holiday. But in reality, we were really having a more of a sacred moment of baptism. That is incredible. Baptism, so. mm, yeah. Wow. That's, that is unexpected. Like, <laughs> first of all, for some – because I know you a little bit, I know that you are a little bit introverted and shy, like to be so bold and like to have parents who are willing to like really make sure that you had a genuine desire to publicly declare mm. your relationship with the Lord, like how sweet of them to see that in you and to mm. really push you and your faith like personally toward that. Um, but then to mm. on such a public day <laughs> with so many people and um, I just love that. The way that the Lord orchestrated that for you in mm-hmm. your life. Um, so being raised in a home where faith and scripture were really important, how did you see that aspect of your life impact you as you grew in your faith after you were baptized? Well, as I learned more about scripture and studied more of God's character, I began to make it more personal to me. It wasn't just my parents' faith and how God provided for our family, but it was something that I knew now he could He could provide for me. So it was mm. growing in the knowledge of, of God's character and that he was faithful to, to stand by what he said. Yeah. Um, so I can remember a time um, my parents would stay four or five years in the Philippines, what we call a term, mm-hmm. um, and then we would go on furlough. And so furlough would be going home, which is kind of an ironic thing to say because it was not home for me, but we'd yeah. be going to my parents' home. Um, my mom's from San Francisco and my dad's from, by long story, um, he's from Canada now. And so we would go home to those countries yeah. far away, you know. Which wasn't home for you. Right. For and yeah. so we would spend a year there. And so my eighth grade year was a year that I went to public school in Canada. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the first time in my my young faith that I really had to depend on God. Um, I said I grew up kind of in a jungle. 
yeah. for part of my life. And so I really didn't even know how to talk on the phone. <laughs> we had like a rotary um, phone that was on our mission base that had mm-hmm. like a two di- digit number so we could call neighbors and, you know, but I yeah. never spoke on the phone. There was no need for me to. So <gasps> just the the concept of talking to a stranger yeah. is completely terrifying. Yes. <laughs> so yes. there's that. Um, you can imagine being in public school and, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know how to talk to other kids. I don't have a TV, so I don't know the TV shows or, you know, anything that's like pop culture would be standard or normal for any eighth grade girl. I was like clueless. Oh my goodness. So yeah, relying on God just to um, provide friends for me. Mm-hmm. And he did. He's yeah. faithful and that's what he, who he is is as God, mm-hmm. you know, he provides for us. And so I think that was the moment or the time when I realized like, okay, he is real. He does what he says he's going to do. And these are the ways he's provided for me with friends and um, hope, I guess. Yeah. Hope that there is um, <clears throat> something beyond my insecurity yeah. that I could cling to. Absolutely. So, yeah. Tell me about the flute. The flute. <laughs> yes. Tell me about the flute in Canada. So uh, the public school I attended was a fine arts school, kind of like Fuafa here. Mm -hmm. Um, And so my major was music. I have always loved music and um, played flute and piano. And so one of the requirements we had to play in a flute ensemble in a public space. And so um, there's this historic fort um, there. And so we set up shop, you know, around Christmas time at this fort to play our version of (laughs) whatever musical (laughs) rendition we had of Christmas songs. And so um, we finished after about an hour of freezing cold and we all packed up and left and I'd gotten a ride home with some friends and I got home and I realized I'd left my flute at the fort. And I was Mm. devastated because I love my flute and I was also terrified because it was probably stolen. Mm. I'd have to confess to my parents and they didn't have any money to buy me a new one. And so um, the only thing I could think of to do was to call them and ask if they had it in the lost and found. Oh my goodness. And so my first hurdle to overcome was I had to find the phone number. And I was like, well, it's going to be a two digit number. How oh hard no. can it be? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so then I realized it's probably more than a two digit number. So I found the phone book and, you know, found their number. And then I had to actually call. And so mm. I called them and I was terrified. I was shaking. My hands were sweating. And I was just sure that someone was going to, you know, chastise me or something. And, oh, um, no sweet old lady answered the phone and she's like of course we have your flute it's here in the lost and found come get it and I was like what that's it <laughs> oh that that's was easy. such a relief <laughs> and so even in such a small you know ridiculous moment of like I've got to pick up the phone the Lord is faithful and he gave me the courage to overcome my fear and mm-hmm. um and my flute was there so. That's so sweet. Like, God didn't have to demonstrate such kindness. Like, but he did, like, in yes. such a very personal and sweet way. I love that. And he answered all my prayers. Yeah. And I didn't have to leave a voice message. That was my other, like, oh, terrifying yes. moment. What if I have to record something? And here I am recording something, which well, is there you go. funny. He provides. He's faithful. And yes, he's, he's good. He's even, even in when we're recording. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... You were in Canada for a while, but Mm -hmm. furlough doesn't last forever either. And so you went back to the Philippines. And at that point, you were not in public school. Right. Is that right? You were at boarding school. Yes. What was that like? So my parents were very clever. They um, they just had two daughters, and we were just um, not even two years apart, but one grade apart. And so they'd actually extended their term before we went to Canada. This would be a five-year term instead of four years. And that way, my sister and I could go to boarding school together. Mm. So we did that. We returned back to the Philippines, and they'd actually given us a choice. They said, you could be homeschooled. Mm-hmm. And both my sister and I are like, never. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> um or you could go to the local school, mm-hmm. which went to grade 10, or you could go to boarding school. And all of our friends, that was kind of what they did. And so we yeah. were like, yes, we're going to boarding school. Um, so I was 13 when I left home, essentially, and went to boarding school yeah. in the capital city of Manila. Wow. Mm-hmm. And my parents were still way up north. It's about a 10-hour mm-hmm. bus ride back in those days. Um, so we saw my parents um, Christmas and summer, usually. That's, yeah, because it's a 10-hour bus ride. Yes. Wow. And they were flying back and forth to the island. And so, um, yeah. So it was 
it was unusual. I feel like now that I look back on it, but for, at the time it was normal. All my yeah. friends were doing it and most of their parents lived in another country. So I was fortunate that my parents lived in the same country. Wow. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So did you do the 10 hour bus ride? Yes. So the first year my parents would drive down and pick us up and mm-hmm. then they realized that's pretty time consuming and I bet our girls could do it on their own. And so they would put us on a bus, my dorm dad, oh drive us to downtown Manila and we'd get on a bus and we would make the bus ride home by nice. ourselves. And just remember, this is like the early 90s. Mm-hmm. No cell phones, no pagers. <laughs> oh so my goodness. They would calculate <laughs> the time that we would get on the bus and just kind of hope that we would make it to the meeting point 10 oh, hours goodness. up the road and they would meet us at this dirt cross section called Junction. And that was it. They would wow. take us the rest of the way home. Wow. And this is, again, the Lord's faithfulness. At the time, I didn't, you know, I didn't think about, oh, God is faithful on this journey. But looking back, like nothing ever happened to us. Mm-hmm. My parents were always there to pick us up. And we, you know, we hated the ride. It was long and uncomfortable and sure. miserable. But my sister and I bonded during those times together. And yeah. looking back, it was actually a good time, a good mm-hmm. memory. I would never let my daughter do that no. today. Never in a million years. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I look back and my parents were so trusting. And so they knew that the Lord would be faithful to us. And mm-hmm. he certainly was. Yeah. So. Such great mm-hmm. favor that he had for you guys mm-hmm. and his kindness to protect you over that. Oh, my goodness. As a parent, I'm thinking, no, yeah, no, no, there's no. no way. But God is bigger than our fears. Yes. Yes. And our insecurities. So I love that he showed you that at such an early age because you were so young. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, did you choose or hope to stay in the Philippines after high school? Yeah. So it's so funny you ask that question because now I was just thinking about this the other day. I have now lived in North America longer than Asia. And so wow. now when I think about home, I think about Texas as home. Wow. I don't even think about Canada as home as much anymore, <gasps> but Texas is home. So it's interesting you say that because at 17 when I graduated, <clears throat> um, I had to go to university somewhere. Mm-hmm. My parents were going on furlough again. My sister had already left. She'd been doing a year of college in Canada. Yeah. And so there really wasn't an option for me to stay. And so I um, I guess I like to push myself, even though I'm shy and I like to challenge myself. So I Mm -hmm. chose to apply to all the U.S. colleges I could Mm -hmm. since my family was going to Canada. And I'm not sure why I thought that was a great idea. But (laughs) at the time, it seemed like a bold, adventurous, independent move. And so I applied to about five or six U.S. colleges and I either missed the deadlines or financial aid or something. And so I reluctantly applied to a few Canadian colleges and the one that all the scholarships and the deadlines happened was where my sister was at, where my dad was at. Wow. So I left very reluctantly, A, going to a college that I did not want to attend, mm-hmm. um, going to a country I did not want to go to. And I had left behind the land of my birth, yeah. my home, my friends. My friends were all dispersing as well. Mm. So even though I was leaving them, I really had nothing to stay for in a sense. And so I really, I felt like I had no choice. Yeah. I was kind of forced into a decision that I did not want to make. Yeah. So I I arrived in Canada um, reluctantly. Yeah. (laughs) And then realized pretty quickly that I had to grow up. Um, So similar to my situation in eighth grade, I was pretty naive and pretty um, insecure Mm. in the sense that I also had no idea how to live an adult life. I had um, never had a bank account. Mm -hmm. I had now talked on the phone a couple times, but like I was twice. Still, <laughs> still not very confident about that. Um, <clears throat> I didn't really know anything about North American culture. Um, and so I felt very, um, very lonely, very isolated, even though my sister was there. She was engaged and I didn't see her very much. And so I felt um, kind of just abandoned. Mm. And so this is another really um, significant time in my life where I felt like, you know what, in the Bible— the Lord said he's faithful. I've been reading my Bible and I still loved his word. And so I I had to come to a decision where I was like, okay, it says this is true about God and his character. Do I believe it? Mm -hmm. I did in the past. Do I still believe that he will be faithful, that he will fill me with the hope that I need and the courage to, you know, go to college and do all the things that I'm supposed to do as a, as a grown up. Um, and I was 17, so I'm still a child really, you know? Um, so I encountered a lot of difficult things in college. Um, and I, 
the Lord again was faithful. He provided friends. He provided a church. He provided um, everything that I really needed, but I still felt alone. Yeah. I was desperate for friends, um, didn't really know how to make them, and was way too shy to become friends. And I wasn't in the dorm, so I didn't make friends in the dorm because I'd lived the dorm life. I was done with that. Oh, yeah. So I lived at home and commuted, you know, as a day student. And I just felt desperately weary mm. of trying to fit in. Yeah. So yeah. It, was a, it was a really tough time mm-hmm. for me, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Because you're, I mean, we're talking total opposite of what you were used to. Like, yes, you were used to a tiny tropical island. And here you are. And I'm assuming Canada is not tropical by any stretch no. of the imagination. <laughs> but also like the idea that like, in your small community, like at boarding school or at home on mm-hmm. your island, like you're surrounded by a community of people who are like mutually pursuing the word of God, like as a regular part of their lives. Mm-hmm. And that just isn't necessarily true when we go to college or mm-hmm. like erupt into adulthood. And we're now trying to build communities in mm-hmm. which that is something that we can share with people and hopefully be mutually encouraged by, Mm -hmm. but it's not a given. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can imagine that would be a really difficult, Mm -hmm. a lot of different transitions to handle all at once. Um, So feeling lonely, I think, makes me really sad. Like I I'm thinking about you as a 17-year-old, and I'm thinking that I'm so sad about that. I don't want that for anybody. Um, But I'm so encouraged at hearing how the Lord demonstrated his character, like reinforcing what you knew his character to Mm -hmm. be within that kind of um, like intense moment or that season of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, As you saw him providing those friendships and community, um, did you find like a less desperate situation awaiting you? I mean, eventually, yes. Yeah. I think another really significant event in my life um, occurred in college. Mm -hmm. And I um, attended college with a friend that I'd grown up with, um, which we, we eventually got married. And this is news. Uh, yes. <laughs> so this is actually the first time I maybe shared it, you know, publicly. But we we ended up getting married, and the marriage was very short lived. Mm-hmm. Did not last very long. There was some infidelity and some other things that occurred. Um, and during that time, I just dove into the Word of God. I had nowhere else to go. I didn't really have that many friends at the time, anyway. And mm-hmm. um, I was afraid to tell anyone what was occurring in my life. I was young, and I just felt like I would be blamed for what was happening. Mm-hmm. And so I really kept it a secret. And mm-hmm. you know, secrecy has there's a lot of power in that yes. power over you. And so I didn't really understand how <clears throat> to get out of that situation. But I I knew that I could trust the Word of God. Yeah. And so I poured over my Bible. Mm. Um, I probably read through my Bible three or four times that year just because I wow. was so hungry for hope and for courage and for um, just something to hold on to. And in Lamentations, uh, it talks about God's faithfulness. Mm-hmm. I think it's verse three. I marked it somewhere. But it's not just, it's the famous verse, great is your faithfulness through every morning. But before that, it talks about even in the difficult times, even in the sorrowful times that God is faithful. And mm-hmm. so that spoke to me that it wasn't just um, when life is going great, God is faithful and we can hang on to that and bless the Lord, all my soul. But it was before that, it's, it's in the desperation and the sorrow mm-hmm. that he sees those and he bottles our tears and he remembers. And we're, you know, I think it says somewhere that in Isaiah that, or engraved on the palms of his hands. Yes. And he holds us closely. And so I, my favorite books of the Bible at that time were the Minor Prophets. <laughs> Which you think about that now, you're like, how depressing. Never in my life <laughs> have I ever said, hey, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And somebody's like, you know, the Minor Prophets. Oh, I love them because they just express the sorrow yeah. of the people of Israel and the sin. And I just felt like I could relate Mm. to their lament and um, to God's response. And there was always hope. There was never just a like, here's my wounds and here's my sorrow and here's your sin and here's your punishment done. Yeah, There was always hope and a plan for restoration. And so that really spoke to me. Um, and so I think during that time, I, I, I battled, of course, my insecurities, my fear, my despair, my loneliness. But through all that, as I read through the Psalms and I read through Zephaniah and Habakkuk and all those prophets, Micah, that the Lord promises comfort. 
Mm-hmm. He promises hope. He promises grace. He promises, you know, his presence. And mm-hmm. so um, those are things you can hang on to. Yeah. And as I walked through those dark times, those lonely, desperate times, um, I really felt like I wasn't abandoned. Yeah. I began to feel like just glimmers of hope that the Lord was with me. And he brought me great friends through my church. Um, I started just to get more involved. And, you know, time time passes. and yeah. um, the sorrows of the past are still there and the scars are there. But I think more than the scars, you remember, you know, the healing process and God's faithfulness yeah. and, what, and the joy that resulted from that. It's kind of like having a baby. Oh, yes. you know, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm never doing that again. And then, you know, two <laughs> babies later, here we are. And you, you don't you don't really remember mm-hmm. the pain. You remember yeah. the joy. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the pain, but not in, <laughs> not in like, oh, I remember the pain. But I like it was there. It was there. Yeah. Like I don't want to deny it because it really it it made the sweetness of God's presence that much sweeter. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like if I don't recognize that I was in a desperate state, uh-huh. I can't recognize the depth of that God went to pull me out of that state. Yes. Um, yes. And how rich His love is because He chose to do that. Mm-hmm. And chose to be with me in those times, just mm-hmm. like he chose to be with you. Like mm-hmm. he met you every day. I would assume every day. Every like, day. If you read through the Bible three times in the year, you're in the word every day. And every he day. is with you every day in the yes. word. Um, and he never ever left you. Like mm-hmm. it's such a beautiful, such a beautiful picture of how he restores and how he heals. And yes, he really is the hope that we cling to. Yes. I love that. Not to minimize scripture in any way, but I think I told you in our conversation that at times I felt like reading through the Bible is like going to Costco. (laughs) You did. And I loved it. Tell me again. (laughs) Not again, not to minimize scripture, but it's you go to Costco and there's nothing you need and you walk out with a cart full of things that you can't live without. (laughs) And I felt like sometimes like that, it was even just like habit open my Bible, you know, start reading whatever book I was on. And then it's like, oh my goodness, I need this for today. This is something I can't live without for today. I need your hope. I need your words to carry me through today. And so Mm -hmm. anyway, it, it makes me, makes me smile when I can look back on those times with a smile, you Mm -hmm. know, it's not just sorrow. Yeah. And it makes me look at Costco in a new (laughs) way. (laughs) <laughs> You'll not really get it the same way. <laughs> you really won't. Listen, I, I promise you next time you go to Costco or Target or wherever it is that you go and you think like, oh, I don't really need that. But, oh, I did need that and I didn't know I needed it. You can be reminded like, first of all, no, you don't. And, and then so, go read your Bible. <laughs> and go read your Bible. I'm just kidding. You, you probably did need deodorant. Maybe you needed some laundry detergent or a snack. But That's more than funny. that, we need the word of the Lord. <laughs> and he knows exactly what we need. Um, I know it could not have been easy to wait. Um, because I know you mentioned to me, like there was a period of waiting too that came along with that time of your life, but, um, to have, um, like that assurance that God was with you. And, um, I know that you said you were reading and clinging to his word, but I also know that you were looking for guidance and wisdom on what to do next. Mm -hmm. Like as somebody who has been in a season of waiting, like what do I do next, Lord? Like, and when will next be? But also, like, I know that you're not in Canada anymore. So right. obviously there was a next thing that the Lord brought you to. Um, so how did you see the Lord continue to guide you and move you th- out of that time of desperation? Mm-hmm. Well, it says in Isaiah, and I think it's chapter 43, that um, God promises to do something new. He says, see, I'm doing something new. Can you perceive it? And I read that at the time and thought, nope, <laughs> not. <laughs> cannot see it. <laughs> There's nothing new. There's just sorrow after sorrow. But as he brought me more friends, as he um, healed me through that mm-hmm. process, uh, I began to look forward, look for a future. Because I knew I couldn't stay, you know, wallowing yeah. in wherever I was. And so I prayed for two things during that time. I prayed for grace and for courage. Grace that I would not be this bitter old woman you know, who that's the only story she ever has to tell and hearing him telling the story, but, but, you, um, didn't but think you were going to tell, so. <laughs> but also courage to move forward and whatever that looked like for me. And I didn't quite know. So I had all kinds of ideas. I um, applied to seminary and I got into seminary and then I realized I don't want to go to seminary. And so I applied to <laughs> another um, grad program. I got into that. I was in ma- master's of TESOL teaching English. 
Mm -hmm. It's a second language. I thought, great, I am getting out of Canada. It's my chance to move. I'm going back home to Asia. I'm Mm going to teach English somewhere. Um, And then I realized, well, I could join the Peace Corps. That would be even better. And so I had all these wonderful ideas until one day um, a friend of mine said, hey, we're having a high school reunion. You should come. I was like, it's only seven years. Why are we doing this? <laughs> but we we did. And that's the only reunion we've ever had. And so I went. That's the there. only one? Yes. <laughs> seven years. That's such a I random. won't tell you how many we've had. I mean, how many years it's been. But well, sure, yeah. Seven years is the only one. <laughs> so I went reluctantly. And I just kind of felt like, you know, I've, now I'm this tainted, you know, statistic. And what will my friends think? Mm-hmm. But I went anyway. And while I was there, um, a guy in my class said, hey, I just joined this organization. You should come on a trip. And it's in Asia. And I was like, oh, sure. I'll, I'll go. go to so, Asia. That's yes, where I want to go. Yes. And so I was like, who knows what, you know, I might just not come back. I'll just buy one-way ticket. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I went on this trip to Cambodia. And it was, um, again, the Lord knew exactly what he was doing, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and his faithfulness, he just led me to where I needed to be. So I went on this trip. And while I was on this trip, I was offered a job. <laughs> Which was very random and very um, surprising and spontaneous. I was not expecting it. And so I thought, well, I could I could look into this too. And, um, so I the job was in Texas. Praise in the Lord. Worth. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was January of 06. And I've um, made the decision to have an interview. I was like, well, at least I'll just check it out. So I flew to Fort Worth in March of 06. Had you ever been to Texas? Yes, actually. Okay. I My parents, when my dad was in grad school, he went to UTA. <clears throat> oh. Yes. And he um, vowed he would never return to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, one of the worst years of their life, of their oh, marriage. No. I guess they were, you know, young and yeah. struggling and no money. And they had two girls in tow and they were like, never. Never. Um, and so when I, I ended up obviously accepting the job because I live here now. But when I told my parents, hey, I'm moving to Texas, my mom's response was, there are 50 states (laughs) to choose from. You had to choose Texas. Yes. But they've since changed their opinion of that. But it was a long plane ride back from Cambodia because I was processing so many things about what to do. And, um, you know, was it just my desire to be in Asia that led me on this wild goose chase? Or was this really from the Lord? Mm -hmm. And so after the interview, I just felt like this is it. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm supposed to be. And I went back to Canada. I sold my piano, (gasps) uh, which was a prized possession because it was, A, my livelihood. I teach piano. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was also a personal, personal thing for me. Yeah. Um, So it it was my own my own thing. Yes. (laughs) And so I had to give it up. Yeah. Um, So I withdrew from grad school. I gave away my scholarship. I uh, sold everything I had and got on a bus, put all my stuff on a bus. And then I drove my stuff on a bus. I drove um, 5,000 kilometers that to Fort Worth. That is a long way. And that was, I arrived in Fort Worth in August. That was eight months from the time I was offered the job and moved here. That's quick. It was very quick. And so I'm still with MANA Worldwide, the organization that offered me the job and love what I do. Um, and I, I, the Lord knows because my desire for adventure and my love for Asia, he's had me traveling all over the world with MANA. So I get little pieces of home coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, if I had trusted my own you know, thoughts and join the Peace Corps, you know. <laughs> Who knows where you'd be? <laughs> where I would be. You still would have had to sell your piano. <laughs> yes. Well, that's true. Yeah. 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 So you came to Texas. Was it smooth sailing? No. Ugh. I mean, you would think that after all this, I've learned that the Lord's faithful. I would, um, it'd be easy, but it really wasn't. I, again, arrived in Texas feeling like a misfit. Mm. I was now 26, newly divorced, um, I didn't really know anything about Texas culture and what I had envisioned was not, <laughs> not what it was when I got here. In my mind, everyone wore cowboy hats and boots and that sure. was just, we all rode horses everywhere you went and that's kind of what it was, but clearly that's not how it is. <laughs> no, not uh, actually. <laughs> um, but I felt very alone and I was, yeah. um, I had met another young man on my trip to Cambodia um, who was also a surprise. I had known him in high school, but just knew of him. Um, 
and in my mind, he was a, a teenager. Yeah. Um, but when I met him, he was not. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was my age. Um, and we hit it off really well. And so um, when I moved to Texas, he had somehow appeared here in Texas, too. That <laughs> sounds <was> so <laughs> mysterious. <laughs> he had his own story. He was uh, living and working in the Philippines, um, living a corporate life, um, but was laid off and moved home. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had the option of moving to other states, but we had sort of hit it off. And so he moved to where I was and where his family was. You sort of hit it off. Yes. And so he moved to Texas. <laughs> yes. This sounds like anybody who's ever met Tammy is like, you know what? I think I'd like to follow uh, her to the ends of the earth oh and that goodness. you will be right. She's great. <laughs> well, his family was here. So that was also a pull. But yeah, um, we started dating. Mm-hmm. And then shortly after that, he broke up with me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not funny. It's in, well, well looking back on it now, it was it was terrible because now I was down to a new country. Oh, know, I'm gosh. trying to navigate yes. things all by myself again. Oh. And anywhere I went, you know, people my age were either married with children or, you know, were in grad school and I was none of those things. And so yeah. it was hard to find friends. But you know, God is faithful again, and He provided yeah. wonderful people in my life and people who are still some best friends today. Mm-hmm. And then um, somehow, I don't know, Kyle yes. came back into my life. He decided that's that, the guy. That's Kyle. the guy. You may know him. Um, and so we we started dating again. And I told him, I was like, Hey, listen, I'm. We got to go to church. I had been going to church, but he'd kind of been in and out. And I was like, Finally, you know, you just just got to try this church I found because it's the only place where I felt like I could hide. <laughs> to be honest, it was a big enough church that, you know, I was done. I was like, I'm, I'm, I've tried all the things and I'm just, I'm tired and I'm lonely. And this place, I'm still hearing the word of God, but I can just hide. And I sit in the balcony and I sit in the very back row of the balcony. So come, come in, come and check that out my church me. that I don't talk to anyone in. <laughs> just I sneak it in the back. When so, it's already dark for worship, yes. I just sneak out right after yes. it's done. So I don't just talk to anybody. So he's like, sure, I'll come. So he came and he sat in the balcony with me. And he was like, this church is amazing. It's great. It's He's like, he loved the preaching right away. Mm-hmm. And he loved the music. And he's like, but um, if I'm coming, I, I can't sit in the back row. So then we kind of migrated. Not a, he's not a back row <laughs> kind of not. a guy. Nope. <laughs> he's not. So we migrated to the front row of the balcony. Oh. Yes, which is a big step for me. And finally, he's like, this has got to stop. We got to, if I'm going to come here, we got to like sit in the sanctuary on the ground floor, which often was very close to the front because we kind of came late. And so then <laughs> we were going to the ushers are like, two, come yes, down this way. And yes. you're like, no, no thanks. So Christ Chapel has, was mm-hmm. actually a blessing yeah. um, that I didn't know would be. And in my, um, I guess my, I don't know, doubt that God could use me still, you mm-hmm. know, and where I was in life. He led me to Christ Chapel and, and to Kyle, really. Yeah. And we've been here, I don't know, 16 years now, something yeah. like that at Christ Chapel. And I love it. Wouldn't want to go anywhere else. Yeah. So, yeah. and we still sit on the ground floor. No balcony. Sorry, no balcony, balcony dwellers. For you guys. But <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes. Y'all are on the front row. No, not floor. quite the front row, but <laughs> you're getting close. You might as well just bump it up to the front row. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> I had no idea. First of all, listener, I've known Tammy for a long time, not super well, but like I've known her for a long time, had no idea anything about this story. Also never would have known that you were shy and introverted. Never would have pegged you for a back row kind of a gal. <laughs> and it's okay that you are. Um, but um, I also would never assume for anybody who's been married for more than a few days, like marital unity and like growing together spiritually, like just doesn't come easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that there are all kinds of um, like hills and valleys and intentional work that goes into like moving from the back of the balcony to the front of the balcony into the floor. But also I'd love to know, like, how did you go from, Hey, come to church with me. Let's get married. Let's move down to the front row. Like, how did you get from there to where you are now, which is like faithfully serving together for years in children's ministry? 
Well, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, but <clears throat> really the Lord has worked a lot in my heart and my life. And um, again, as I've learned more about the character of God and um, what he promises he will fulfill, he can't go back on his word. Mm -hmm. As I learn more about the Lord, as I um, got older, you know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's an I experience. Too. I got <laughs> older too. Life. I have more experiences of God's faithfulness, more examples of his love to me, more examples of his um, presence in my life. Mm -hmm. And so knowing all that, looking back on all the hurdles I've gone through, it's like, well, you know, the Lord's still going to be faithful no matter what, no matter what. Yeah. With my insecurities, my shyness, all those things, it's really very small compared to, you know, the grand scheme of things and mm -hmm. God's plan for my life. And so kind of learning to put those things aside and saying, Lord, what, what do you want me to do with my life? I'm here now. Um, whether or not I've done everything correctly in my life, that's not, really, not the issue. Right. It's what, what do you have planned for me and how can I glorify you? So Kyle and I, I don't even know what year it was. Several years ago, Cody preached a sermon on um, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. And it really resonated with both of us. We immediately heard the ends of the earth. That's all we heard. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like at each you know? other and we said, this is it. This is, we're, go we're going home. Um, it was home for him too. I don't know if I mentioned, but he was a missionary kid as well. Um, so Philippines and Asia was just home to him. So we immediately heard that. We, I think we even marched up to the front and announced to Cody what our plans were and like had him pray for us. It's like, this is it. Um, so we went on a survey trip back to the Philippines. We had two job offers and we were just sure this is it. Yeah. We're going to change the world and run an orphanage and or be a boarding home parent. Um, and it's going to be great. And we came back from the Philippines and both of us, we didn't really talk about it until a couple of days after. And we both kind of felt like that was not it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was surprising because I was scared to tell him. I don't really want to do this, yeah. you know, hoping that he would feel the same way, but really sure that he was going to have to convince me to do this. Yeah. And he looked at me and said, you know what? This is not for us. Yeah. This, this isn't it. So we went to Guatemala next because there was another opportunity there for mm -hmm. orphan work and uh, with Mana. And we just felt like after we came back unsettled, like this yeah. is just not where you want us to be. And I was super disappointed yeah, because I wanted to go overseas and live overseas again. I wanted my children to have the experience of living as a missionary kid. Mm -hmm. And then COVID hit. That was 2019 and COVID wow. hit. And it was the Lord's um, not foreknowledge, of course, that he mm -hmm. knew what would happen and that it would not be the best time for us. And so Kyle and I kind of reconvene. We're like, now what? We had this all planned out. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, Cody said other places too, you know. <laughs> it wasn't just the <laughs> ends of the earth. And so we kind of, you know, prayed through that. And we really felt like, you know what? It's, it's Judea. It's Samaria. It's Fort Worth. This is where we need to be. And so because of that, we felt like, well, Christ Chapel's our home. Mm -hmm. We should make that Judea. And not that Christ Chapel needs our help in Anyway, mm -hmm. but I just felt like that's where to start. Like our children yeah. are in kids ministry. We should start there. Yeah. Let's just be on the on-call list. <laughs> that's what I that thought. That is really, it seems so safe. Like maybe they'll call in some I'll volunteer. And we had done this before COVID where we, you know, helped in the nursery and changed diapers and things. And it was great, but no real commitment. And it was really Kyle. I'll give him all the credit. Him and the <laughs> Lord, the Lord speaking through him because he's like, Tammy, why, why are we saying that we're committed to this, but not really being committed. You know, he's yeah. like, why are we on the on-call sub list? Like we, need a, we just need to jump in and take a class. So in my mind, I would take, you know, the baby class or the preschool class and I would just hold yes. babies all day mm -hmm. <laughs> and it'd yep. be great. Uh -huh. And then I was given um, first grade boys. That's not babies. <laughs> They smell not And the I have same. a first grade boy. So I was like, well, I'm <laughs> fine. I'll just, you know, it's fine. <laughs> I truly was not super excited on Sundays to go and teach them because yeah. I, I taught all week piano and I was like, this isn't the last thing I want to do. And Kyle was so excited. So I didn't want to, you know, discourage <laughs> him. And then as time went on, I realized that you don't just teach first grade boys, you move up with them. Yep. So I'm now in fourth grade boys mm. and I love it. I actually love it. And so <gasps> the Lord 
just really used all of all my fears and insecurities and all my my stubbornness even and said, yeah. you know what, you've you've you made that commitment, you know, when you were 10 to make your faith public. This this is what it looks like. <laughs> I was like, great. <laughs> so, but to be honest, I I look back on my dragging feet and stubbornness, and I, I don't really know why I was so selfish about that time in my life. But so I challenge anyone, if you're looking for a way to serve, just just try it. Take one step and the Lord's going to honor that. And he's going to, he'll give you the joy that you need to do what you need to do. And now I don't want to miss a Sunday. I love those yeah. boys. They're they love you too. Uh, well, one has to. He's my son. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is such a joy to walk into that class on Sunday morning and know those boys are going to be there and they expect me to be there. And just, and I love their personalities. They're hilarious. And my room is chaos. So please don't come by because <laughs> you may not appreciate the chaos. We are learning, but it's, it's so fun. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. So that was Kyle's prompting from the Holy Spirit just to <clears throat> give me that nudge to do it. Yeah. I'm and so then, glad you did. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. As a parent of somebody who's been in your class, even just a couple of times, like, it is. You have such an impact on the kids and your care that because it is, they're in your care. You care for them. And when you show up each week, even if you're not your best, even if it is <sighs> chaos, like even in the midst of the chaos, they see you being there and they see you caring for them and they know that they can trust you. And because they can trust you, they're trusting that you're giving them the word of God and that's what you're giving them. I'm super emotional about it. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> no. I'm just so grateful that you did say yes and that Kyle was prompted by the Holy Spirit. So, well, it's probably not chaos for them. It's just chaos for me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so true. <laughs> but you know, it's so true because even in the chaos of our lives, the Lord is faithful mm-hmm. and he brings order and peace out of all of that wreckage in our life. Mm-hmm. And whether we know it or not, you know, we look back later and we, we can see his hand in all the things, yeah. even, you know, even in fourth grade boys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. I love them. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Yeah. But you are. But I... <laughs> <laughs> I, somehow I got roped into middle school ministry, which, to be honest, that is even more fearful than fourth grade boys. Yeah. Like that to me is a whole different world. Um, but as as I looked at what that meant, it's just obedience again. It's like, Lord, you called me to this. I'm going to just step out in faith. And, mm-hmm. you know, middle school is such a volatile time. We know that. And yeah. so I see these little girls who are not so little anymore and mine's one of them. And whether they have it all together or they don't or they're insecure, I I remember that. I've been insecure my whole life, you know, Mm -hmm. but there is a place where we can find security and hope and refuge. And um, that's the word of God. That's in Christ alone. And so I think maybe the Lord has something going there, you know, that I can point them to him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's my goal that if, if one person can acknowledge Christ as our Savior. Yeah. And that they can, they know where to go when they have chaos in their lives. And mm-hmm. it's all worth it. Yeah. I think. I'm thinking about you, like, and the time that year that you had in Canada when things were feeling so desperate and the Lord was so true to his character and like remained and remained and remained and remained mm-hmm. and sat with you. Mm-hmm. And like, he was not afraid of your chaos. He was not deterred by it in any way. He in no way looked at you and saw anything shameful. Like he looked at you and saw the beauty of Christ. And I'm thinking about how much that impacted you and how you get to be a picture, like a shadow picture mm-hmm. of that to any number of middle school girls who are in that little tiny middle school girl pit, whether Mm -hmm. it's big or small, and they get to see you living out that reality, the hope that we have in a God who won't leave us and Mm -hmm. who isn't afraid of our chaos and isn't ever going to look at us and see shame because he knows that Christ has covered us in his perfect Mm -hmm. blood. And I love that. I'm praising God that (laughs) you get to do that. That's such a beautiful picture, Tammy. Thank you. It's too emotional. This is too emotional of an episode <laughs> for me. Um, do you ever find yourself 
back in that same mindset that you had in Canada, that lonely, insecure mindset? You know, if I'm honest, I will always, maybe it's my personality or, you know, how God's made me. I'll always feel insecure about something, about Mm -hmm. the way I look or the way I play the piano or the way I, you know, disciple children or raise my my own kids, of course. But I think there's a settled peace in knowing that my worth and my security does not come from this world. Mm-hmm. It doesn't come from what people think of me. Yeah. <laughs> Especially after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um you know it it, it comes from the Lord, mm-hmm. the Lord who knows me and sees me and who did do a new thing in my life. And yes, now I can perceive it. I see it and mm-hmm. I know it. Um, I think there's a different perspective now. Yeah. I think there's a knowledge and that um, a deep seated, just awareness of the Lord and his graciousness and his faithfulness. And that's not to say that the rest of my future is going to be smooth sailing. Right. I don't have a very good track record, <laughs> so I can anticipate there'll be more yeah. to come. But I think that the Word of God never changes, mm-hmm. and the Lord never changes. His character doesn't change. So I can sink my teeth into that. Yeah. I can know that He will remain faithful to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. I can't imagine there being any more encouraging things that you can say because you've said so many good encouraging things, but we're going to wrap up in a minute. And so I wanted to give you one more chance if there was anything that you were thinking about, praying about, or that the Lord had put on your heart that you wanted to share um, before we close our time together. I just think that faith is not passive. Mm -hmm. And God certainly isn't passive. But sometimes it seems hard because you have to take a step, and it's an active step. But the Lord always honors that. Mm -hmm. And so if I could encourage anyone who might be in a pit of despair, it's like the Princess Bride. Yes. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. (laughs) (laughs) That really, you know, the Lord himself was in the deepest pit of despair. And so he not only can relate, but he can pull you out of that pit. So there's always hope. There's always a new morning with his faithfulness, Mm -hmm. you know, like the sun rising. And so I guess that's all I have to say about that, just that the Lord really is faithful Mm -hmm. and you'll never be disappointed if you put your faith in him. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I'm glad I asked. (laughs) Well, Timmy, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. We'll have to talk about piano and creativity and beauty on another episode because (laughs) I want to pick your brain about that too. Um, But I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the story that the Lord has woven in your life. And um, I'm going to pray and praise him for that. Mm, Thank you for having me. Um, God, you are holy and beautiful and so good. Um, Your character never changes. Your word never changes. Um, And because you have promised to um, redeem your people and you've given us a real hope in the person of Jesus Christ, we praise you. We cling to that hope knowing that it will never fail us. And God, you will never, ever disappoint us. We know you are worthy of our praise. And so today we praise you just because you are good. I ask that you would give us... um, words of encouragement as we um, go throughout our day today, that we would spur one another on to praising you um, and that we would share the good news of the hope of your gospel with the people that you put before us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. For more episodes, be sure to follow Encouraged and Equipped.